Uh, well, good morning and thank you for coming along. Can I do two things before I start this morning? First is um, uh, just congratulate Roger on his extreme fashion sense. I think uh, Stuart is one out of the box. Um, I don't know whether it's going to catch on, but uh, you know, if, if it does, I've put a proprietorial claim on it, Roger. Um, second is to acknowledge the work over the last um, several months of Catherine Delore, who uh, came to our rescue. Uh, on the 23rd of February and has been uh, part of the media team all the way through. Um, so it's a, it's a considerable disruption for her coming from Wellington to relocate here. Uh, she heads back to the uh, happy work of uh, ensuring that IRD uh, communicate well with the public and uh, I just want to publicly thank her for uh, the work that she's done over the past uh, uh, many months, 10 months or so. Uh, it's been uh, great to have had you on board Catherine. Um, today I'm very pleased to announce that uh, most of Banks Peninsula as an area that has been white will be rezoned re to green. This will mean that uh, a total of 5,443 properties that have been white zoned will now be green zoned. Of that, uh, 4,359 are residential properties or lifestyle properties. Uh, the balance uh, fall into the category of commercial buildings or public buildings. Um, the, uh, this decision means that there are around about 20 properties that will remain uh, in the east of Diamond Harbour uh, and Church Bay that will need further work, further consideration uh, as the, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the next few weeks. Um, so this is the culmination of work by the uh, Port Hills Group uh, who have been looking at the life threat and uh, rockfall issues that are most affected that area. Uh, it's a very positive sign. It brings now a total of 175,000 plus properties that are green uh, in the Greater Christchurch area. Alongside that, uh, I'm very pleased to announce today uh, that the regional policy statement is going to be changed by use of the Sarah Powers. Regional policy statement is something that all regional councils are required to produce uh, and it gives a fair indication of a range of activities that are taking place within that region. One of them is uh, the areas in which residential growth can be expected. You'll be aware that for some years now the uh, local councils, Waimakariri, Selwyn and Christchurch have been uh, collaborating with the uh, people at ECAN to bring out what was called the Urban Development Strategy, uh, known as Plan Change 1. And what we're effectively doing today is setting aside Plan Change 1, which has had a number of objectors to it, uh, uh, but also many, many protagonists of it, uh, and um, effectively replacing it, uh, placing it into the regional policy statement by inserting a new Chapter 12A. I think the uh, time that we've taken to get to this point has been fair to all of those uh, who had an interest in it uh, and this move is, is uh, supported by all of the uh, local authorities uh, who are involved. What it will mean is that there is uh, a significant amount of land that is now uh, effectively consented for subdivision but will still need appropriate subdivision consents that mean uh, testing of the land for its seismic suitability uh, and for uh, all the other aspects of a subdivision. Uh, alongside that, um, I'm also able to confirm that the economic indicators for uh, Canterbury at the moment are extremely strong. The Sarah officers developed uh, some months ago a dashboard of indicators that were designed to show what was happening within our local economy. And I think the things that are most encouraging is that while we have uh, a, a slight negative on uh, the population side, we also have uh, look, what looks like a trending growth in population figures. Uh, but, but more importantly, the Paymark data, which is the FPOS uh, expenditure inside the Greater Christchurch area, uh, continues at 95% plus, uh, meaning that we are in a, a pretty settled period and can look forward to that growing in the months ahead. We've been very cautious about these indicators. Uh, but I think it was necessary to set up that dashboard so that we could have uh, an, an authoritative understanding of exactly what's happening in our local economy. Some of the good things are the growth in the manufacturing sector and the growth in the export sector. I think those are tributes not only to 
the people who run those businesses, uh, but also to the wider Canterbury workforce. There'd be virtually no one in the Greater Christchurch area who isn't at the moment making some sort of concession uh, uh, to, the, to the workplace or for the workplace in order to keep the business or the activity running. And I think that is this, uh, in, these indicators are a great tribute to uh, people's willingness to step up at a time like this. Whether it's just working in um, you know, cramped uh, temporary facilities um, or having to take a different route to work, I think it's a, a great tribute to the, the workforce as well as those who have um, uh, committed uh, to, to keeping those businesses here. Um, I think uh, the, the import-export figure of $990 million, uh, for the August month uh, was, was a particularly good indicator of uh, the, the, the future for the, uh, or the immediate future for the economy. And the most encouraging thing is that job advertisements in Canterbury, as you would expect in the circumstance, are up 73% on the same time last year. So uh, we're in pretty good shape here. Uh, red zone settlements are continuing, um, and uh, Roger will talk more about those in a few minutes. I think uh, the, the comment I would make simply is that uh, more than 27% of the uh, now six or so thousand households involved uh, have chosen one of the government's options. Uh, a very, very large number have sent back their uh, consent forms approaching 95%. Uh, so I think that indicates that people are making decisions uh, and the decisions that we're making about new land being available coming alongside that will be helpful to them. Uh, the insurance situation has been one that we've been monitoring uh, for quite some time. Uh, and yesterday it was, uh, we, we received a report from IAG, uh, a large insurer in New Zealand, that they are coming back on risk uh, in Canterbury, certainly in the Ashburton district and in the Haranui district. So they're closing in on Christchurch quite rapidly and I think this should be seen as an extremely encouraging trend. Um, the, that particular company uh, retails through several brands, including a number of banking arrangements as well. Uh, so I take that as a, a very big positive. The Orange Zone continues to be the largest focus of uh, Roger's work and the work of his team. And this week I convened meetings in the residential Orange Zones with geotechnical engineers uh, uh, with officials from government law that we could get uh, clarity around what we are describing as a myriad of complexities uh, that need to be sorted before that rezoning can occur. There is, I appreciate, some growing frustration around that and as someone who has a house in the, red zone, in the orange zone I can definitely appreciate that uh, concern. Uh, but we are moving, I think, uh, appropriately towards uh, zoning decisions uh, remembering that these have huge effects on people uh, and that uh, you, you are looking at trying, as we said all along, to preserve the, the uh, opportunity that people have to enjoy their uh, properties uh, as they have chosen to have them. So uh, I can't give you an increased timeline or a shorter timeline, uh, but I would want to make it clear that uh, we are making an enormous amount of progress uh, and uh, we would expect to have those decisions uh, as soon as all of those complexities are properly sorted. Head over now to uh, Roger, who will um, um, <coughs> make a few comments and then very happy to take questions. Just, I mean, just on the issue around the orange and the white zones, I think sometimes people feel a frustration when they hear an area has gone from um, white to green that we've sort of left the orange people out the, the people working in the white zones um, around the Port Hills, the Banks Bridge, are different, different geotech engineers to the ones that have been working in the orange, to the, in the orange zone. So we haven't, there, isn't, there isn't a case of sort of resource was taken from one area and put in another, and that's actually delayed orange zone decisions. In terms of the residential um, red zone, we've done 135 settlements, and there's another 360 to date. Um, so far, a third of the people have selected option one, um, and two thirds have selected option two. So we would expect over time though, it's probably going to end up being more like a quarter and three quarters. That is one quarter will select option one and three quarters will select option two. The reason for the bias at the moment towards option one is I think it's, um, it's uh, people are still waiting to deal with their insurance companies to find out exactly where they end up before they can actually, um, with confidence, select option two. Um, demolitions. Um, 
The number of buildings signed off either for full or partial demolition since February the 22nd is now 1,243. Um, and there's been 699, 600, nearly 700 completed demolitions. 530 of those have been, have been full demolitions. So we're nearly, nearly half the buildings that need full demolitions have now been done. There's 95 demolitions underway right now. Um, significant buildings, there are 20 underway at the moment and there's another 16 being tendered or reviewed. Um, I had the pleasure of going into the Grand Chancellor yesterday. Um, I haven't actually been in before, it's a bit like going to the dentist in some ways. You sort of know you need to go in there and, you know, and, and do something, but you, know, you don't really enjoy it when you're in there, you don't really want to go back again either. Um, but the building is being propped at the moment, and so they're putting in you know, propping to make it stronger so that people can actually work further up in the building. Um, we'd hope to sort of have some big drawings to you explaining how that demolition process will work, but we'll have those for you next time. We want to do it, we want to do it properly with big pictures, and I haven't got pictures that are good enough for me anyway. But um, there's also an, an external staircase being installed over these next, next period of time, so more people can be working in there, and also a lift, so more people can be working in there at once. Um, the Copthorne Durham um, appears to have been further damaged in Sunday's earthquake. So um, some of the internal columns um, were damaged, it would appear, from the quake. So we're doing some work at the moment, or we're doing the work, the, 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 the demolition guys are doing some work at the moment to strengthen those so that work can hopefully resume um, next week. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a setback for that building by about a week by having to do that strengthening work in the meantime. The Clarendon, um, tenders um, closed this morning. Um, we received three, I understand. Um, so we've now got to go through and just consider what those different tender prices are and the different conditions around those tenders. But it's been, a, a, you know, it's been quite a thorough process. We've had um, you know, expertise from both within New Zealand but also internationally on that. So the tender process is underway at the moment for the Convention Centre, Westpac Tower, the Crown Plaza, the ECAN and the Markham's Building both on Kilmore, the Trade Union Centre on Armagh, and the Internal Affairs um, building on Cashel Street. Just staying on Cashel Street, um, we're still on track for the opening for Cashel Mall um, at the end of October. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm still confident we're going to get there, Minister. So stock delivery, in fact, is going to um, be is going to happen next week. We're going to start happening next week. Staff and customer car parking, the soft landscaping, which is I think you know plants and that sort of stuff. Um, fire engineering, security, and all being done at the moment, um, but we're we're going to work really hard to try and get to that that um, that deadline by the end of next week. And then lastly, um, the public bus tours. So these are going to start on November the fifth. Um, they'll start that weekend. They'll run from Cramner Square. Um, they'll run both Saturday and Sundays. Um, we'll be we'll have a modest charge on those. Um, so you need a ticket, and we'll tell people as soon as we know what that mechanism is, how they can get themselves a ticket. Um, and I guess also just before we've kicked those off for the public, we've been having them for the bereaved family, so we had some of them, um, we took um, 80 in yesterday, and there were about 120 went in last week. So I think those people have found it. Some of them had, some of them had been in with the police after, you know, soon after the event, but most of them still found it quite a, quite a difficult experience.